Hi, I'm Robert Mugga, and I research cities. And uh, I'm Misha Glenny, and I just sort of chat about them, really. And we're here to tell you about cities, some of the risks they're facing, and how cities are seeking to surmount them. Um, and if we get cities right, Misha, we just might make it through the 21st century. Yes, get them wrong, Rob, and we're doomed. So, I want to start with a question. Have you ever lived in a rural area? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I have. That's right, you are a peculiar chap, aren't you? I've never lived in the country, and I don't intend to. And you know what? More and more people agree with me. And if you live in a city, you're going to live longer, you'll be better educated. What's not to like? I don't think anyone in this room is going to disagree with you, Misha. As we've heard over and over and over, more than 54% of the world's population currently lives in a city. And by 2050, it's going to be something like two-thirds. 90% of that population growth is going to be happening in the developing world. And what makes this truly remarkable is that up until the early 1800s, less than 1% of the world's population lived in a city. Not only that, here's something you may be interested in, Rob that 80% of global wealth is already created in cities. Yeah, Misha, I did know about that because you pinched that from my research. Uh, but, I mean, the point is that cities really are phenomenal. They take up less than 2% of the world's surface area, but they're responsible for more than 70 to 75% of its emissions. Not only that, according to the WHO, every year 7 million people die from pollution and almost every one of those lives in a city. So, creating sustainable cities is not just desirable, it's actually essential. Yeah, I mean, as we've heard over and over over the last couple of days, we literally won't survive if we don't get our cities right. But Misha, there's just one problem. Um, what's that, Rob? We don't really know that much about cities. But that's absolute nonsense, Rob. I mean, look, here we've got a whole conference devoted to cities. You and I witter on about them all the time. Yeah, well, it may, may, may seem like that, Misha, but you know, apart from a couple of hundred cities in North America, Western Europe, and bits of Asia, we don't know about the thousands of cities that are growing at breakneck speed, especially in the global south. So how do you account for this absence of comparative data? Well, my sense is we still are locked into a prism of the nation-state system. We're in a four-century-old ex Westphalian experiment where nation-states are what determine the nature of international affairs. Think of it. Our global international system is still mediated by national politicians and diplomats operating in the national interest. And that trickles all the way up to our global institutions, like the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund. Yes, that reminds me that last year the British nation voted to leave the European Union. But if you look at the majority, the great majority, of big cities, which creates much of the wealth in Britain, they overwhelmingly voted to stay in the EU. Now, why was that? First of all, youthfulness. Young people wanted to stay in Europe. Right. Secondly, we have education. College-educated people are much more likely to vote to remain in the EU. Then we have investment and infrastructure. If you put money into cities, they become much more open. And fourthly, diversity. Uh, the diversity of our cities essentially led to a very strong European sentiment there. Now, the British nation, in its wisdom, voted us out, although I think the Jedi are back to, to judge by last night's election results, which I'm very pleased about. But the lesson I take from the EU business is this. Dynamic cities are ones which are looking to make connections all over the place across borders whereas stagnating cities are angry cities. Misha, that is fascinating, and maybe the first bit of research you didn't steal from what I've already written. <laughs> uh, but it reinforces the point I was making earlier, that we have just under 200 nation states right now, but thousands of cities around the world that are growing in power and influence. Think about Tokyo, with a population of 34 million people and an annual GDP of $2 trillion. Wow. It's more than Russia, Iran, South Africa combined. Or consider, I don't know, New York or Los Angeles or Chicago with a police force that rivals most nation states. So basically what's happening is, is that cities are punching above their weight economically but below their weight politically. So what are the risks, given that, that, that cities are facing? Misha, I, 
just the opportunity you've given me now to bring out one of my toys. So let me go back ah, over here. Right, now a note of explanation here. Rob is very big on something called data visualization. At heart, God bless him, he is an academic with an almost, I would say, erotic relationship to numbers. <laughs> However, after uh, some avuncular advice from me, he switched to data visualization. And what this means is, is that finally we can all understand what he's talking about. And I have to say, the results are pretty remarkable. I think this work is fantastic. Rob, talk us through it a bit. Right. So let's start with city size. In the, you know, in the 1950s, there were just three mega cities in the world. Today, there are over 30. And they're growing in size and scale in ways that we never could have imagined. Uh, take a look at Shanghai right here. What I'm showing you right now is a visualization that basically captures its early size in the 1980s when it was a pretty big city of 11 million people, growing all the way to a city of 25 million people Whoa. today. Now, if you were to go essentially a couple of hundred miles north uh, towards Beijing, you'd also see the world's first super city, a city that's merged with various metropolitan areas to form a city called Xinjiang of 130 million people. Good God. Well, in the work, if you have 130 million people, how do you begin to start dealing with the issues associated with places that size? Well, it's a great point, Misha. I mean, how do you manage a city of that scale? And it's not just in China. It's all over the global south that we're seeing cities growing at this breakneck speed. Right. OK. Now, I know you want to come on to something called the fragile city, which is a concept you, you have developed. Tell us a bit about fragile cities, Rob. So a fragile city is one essentially where the social contract has come unstuck. What you see is a concentration of different kinds of risk factors that accumulate and converge in the urban space. So things like income inequality, youth unemployment, uh, access to services, crime, terrorism, conflict, and even natural disasters. And when you see the congregation or the clustering of these different risks, cities become more volatile. And we've created up here a standardized index to capture this fragility. What you see is every single city in the world with more than 250,000 people in it, uh, which amounts to about 2,000 cities, by the way. Um, and without going into detail on the algorithms that drive this thing, uh, the point is the redder the city, the larger it is, the more fragile. OK, so when we start seeing red here, Rob, what can we expect coming down the road to us? Well, Misha, it really depends because, you know, cities enter and exit fragility all the time. But what you can see as you go over the last 15 years is a concentration of fragility, urban fragility, especially in parts of Africa, North Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, uh, and Southeast Asia. Um, and this visualization tells us that as fragility deepens, you know, we get cities that could almost tip over from fragility into being failed. So what happens then? Well, Misha, as night follows day, um, what you can see is waves and waves of refugees. What you see here is every single refugee in the world since 1990. Each dot represents a cluster of refugees. And as I zoom in, you'll have a better sense of its distribution. Uh, there are more than 21 million refugees right now in the world, more than at any time, really, since the Second World War. So cities can produce a lot of wealth, but they can also, under certain circumstances, produce a lot of refugees as, as well. And I think it's worth pointing out here that this does not include this data, the 31 million in internally displaced people uh, who were on the move in 2016 alone. So that's a, a hell of a lot of people that we're dealing with. Yeah, so what's not captured here, of course, is the full scale of displacement. We're just focusing on refugees. But each of these points represents a story of struggle and, more importantly, survival. Uh, two other points to mention about this visualization. The first is um, that what we're seeing is a, a, a deepening of fragility in certain parts. Uh, and most refugees who are fleeing from these areas are not bringing terrorism, they're fleeing from it. In the United States, there have been 785,000 uh, asylum claimants since 9-11. Not one is associated with a terrorist fatality. The second point to mention is that refugees are, for the most part, not fleeing from poor countries into wealthy countries, which is what we see in the global headlines, certainly in the industrialized West. Refugees are, for the most part, fleeing between poor countries and poor countries. And so as we see more urban fragility around the world, we can expect to see more refugees. Right, and uh, of that 10% in the past two or three years or so, of course, a lot of them have come to Europe. And a lot of Europeans feel pretty uh, resentful towards the United States in as much that they intervene in Iraq and then you get a series of events and this triggers waves of refugees. They don't come to the US on the whole, they go to Europe. But I don't think America can be complacent. 
In fact, I was talking to a compatriot of yours recently, Rob, who said that Canadian strategic planners now consider that their southern border starts in Brazil. Yeah, I mean, the point is we can't just be only focusing on trying to stabilize nation states abroad. We have to really start getting our heads around building resilience inside cities. And that's not easy for our world's bilateral agencies and multilateral agencies to get their head around. It's still a big challenge, but the writing's on the wall, Misha. Okay, so we've got war, we've got refugees, and let's think of another existential crisis, climate change and flooding. Well, yeah, most cities around the world, as everyone here knows, are coastal. And I mean, a remarkable fact here. Uh, more than two-thirds of the world's population, Misha, live within 25 miles of an ocean. Yeah, but that makes a lot of sense. Well, it did make sense until we saw rising sea levels, right? So we have to think about reversing centuries of urban planning. Right. Okay. So well, we, what I want to show you here, Misha, here. Uh, is a map of the world. Now, all the world's going to be affected by rising sea levels in varying degrees. What this map shows you is variations in temperature between zero and four degrees Celsius and what the, rel the relative rise in sea level will be. And as you can see, the Gulf states are going to be pretty badly hit. Wow, that is truly frightening. On the bright side, Mar-a-Lago seems to be the first place to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, not just Mar-a-Lago, Misha, all of Miami's going to go, because basically Miami's built on porous limestone, and no amount of break wall development is going to limit uh, its flooding. And one key point to remember here is that climate scientists around the world, um, they actually think we're going to blow the 1.5 target that we set in COP21. So we're in for some pretty stormy weather ahead. So back to my earlier point, we're all doomed. Right. It's not looking good, Misha. But there are some examples of where we're seeing cities turning things around. Oh, yes. Do tell. Well, no city is an island, right? Cities are interlinked, as we've heard over and over here, in international networks and nodes and systems. But cities are also linked to their rural hinterlands. And what I want to show you here, Misha, uh, is the heart of the Amazon. What we're looking here is Redonia, a state in the middle of Brazil. Uh, where you have the Amazon basin and the biggest carbon sink on the planet processing more than 10 million metric tons of carbon a year. This is a road that was built back in the uh, early 80s. And what you're seeing here is land that's been slated uh, for both production of soy as well as cattle. And it'll just give you a sense of the scale here as we roll out. Not looking very good to me, Rob, at the moment. Right. So if I get it right, the red areas are where deforestation is increasing, and the blue areas, and frankly, I can't see any blue areas, is where deforestation is decreasing. So once again, we're doomed. Well, you're right. It's not looking good, except here's a map of every single national park and state park in Brazil introduced since the 1980s. And although you can see some encroachment into those park areas, you're also seeing... It actually works! Yeah, I mean, to a point, right? So deforestation, loss of forest cover is due to a whole host of factors, as everyone here knows, atmospheric and anthropomorphic. And what's happening here, what's driving this deforestation right now, isn't just domestic consumption in the big cities like Sao Paulo and Rio but it's also being driven by insatiable demand in cities across China, India, North America, and around the world. But it's true there's evidence that uh, municipal administrations understand better than national politicians the need to husband natural resources because they're future thinking and they're practical thinking on the whole. No, that's right. I think, you know, the good news is that despite climate denial at the highest levels, including here in the United States, uh, cities are taking action. You know that since Donald Trump uh, called to withdraw the United States from the Paris Agreement uh, early this month, within days, more than 76 cities, the count's probably higher by now, came out defiantly saying they would meet those commitments regardless. And they're coming up with all sorts of techniques, carbon emission reduction targets, we've got congestion zones, we've got rapid bus transit systems, all sorts of practical measures. Absolutely. And it's not just talking and introducing policies. I mean, cities and counties and states across the United States are investing in renewables, including solar and wind. Uh, as you can see, over the last 30 years, there's been a spread whole series of stories there, but there is a kind of irony right now that the country that invented a lot of this technology, be it wind or solar, is about to lose out to 
China and other countries in R&D deployment installation. That's right. Well, I was reading an article in the FT only last month which said that China and India are now increasingly powering their cities using renewables. Indeed, the paper argued that the 21st century is going to be the last century of fossil fuels. No, I think you're right, Misha. I mean, cities really, they get it, you know? Cities are like the proverbial canary in the mine. They get out there, they're on the front uh, Rob, line. Rob. I What's think, that? I, I think the canary died. Oh, uh, what do you mean? It was nailed to its perch. It is an ex-canary. Uh, okay, we need a different metaphor. We need a different metaphor, or it. worse still, it's probably a good metaphor. Well, I mean, if we want to resuscitate that bird and keep it alive, cities are going to have to step up, and the good news is they already are. As nation states are defaulting on their sovereignty, we're seeing cities precipitate what is nothing less than a devolution revolution. We're seeing cities engage in collective action on everything from climate to public safety. There are more than 200 intercity networks around the world, more than there are for nation states, by the way, agitating on all sorts of activities. Take the case of the C40, right, which has got more than 7,400 mayors together to sign a covenant on clean energy and renewable energy sources. Take the case of the newly installed Global Parliament of Mayors, which was set up last year in The Hague, and it's agitating for a new urban agenda. And what it really wants is not just a voice, Misha, it wants a vote and a veto. So we've finally arrived at that stage where the local really is global, or glocal, as the late Benjamin Barber was wont to say. And I have to say, whenever I go around the world, it is cities and mayors I find really engaging with pragmatic solutions to urgent problems, whereas national politicians tend to be chasing after the lowest common denominator for short-term ends. I agree, Misha, and so now's the time where all of us, we can't just be talking and researching these issues. We gotta get out there and empower our mayors. Who would have thought we'd end up with a quote from Karl Marx? The point is not to understand it, but to change it. Sign me up, Rob. Great.